Okay, in this video I'd like to start discussing degeneracy and symmetry. And this video follows directly on from my last video, which I solved the two-dimensional box, or I got the wave functions and energy values in a two-dimensional box. And it also follows on from a series of videos I did on the, the two-dimensional well. And I, didn't, I think I did maybe six solutions to the two-dimensional well. One of them was in good rigor, and the other ones were trying to show something else. There's something else I'll talk about again here. So just to quickly remind ourselves of the 2D box. We had a Cartesian plane where by, on the X we had um, up, up to, we'll say a box going up to A, and on the Y values we had a box going up to V, or uh, up to B, excuse me. We said that inside the box the potential energy was equal to zero, and we said outside the box the potential energy was equal to infinity. And when we solved this, we got we found that we had in, uh, intrinsically two quantum numbers, whereby we had n and m, and they corresponded to the following energy levels. Similarly, the wave functions uh, were once again a function of the quantum numbers n and m, and we got this. Okay, so n pi x over a times the sine of m pi y over b times this normalized factor or normalization factor two over root a b. So what I'd like to do is look at the case where a is equal to b and we literally do have a square box. If we do this and all you literally do is plug in a different values for uh, for n and m. So just to point out n goes between we we'll say it, it looks oh it doesn't look like that it looks something like this okay n can be any integer value from 0 to infinity and so can m. Alright so let's just start trying some different values of n and m. And I'm going to tell you that if I look at the, si the wave function of psi 1, 2, I'm going to get an energy level of 5 times h bar squared times pi squared over 2m a squared. And also, if I try a wave function psi 2, 1, I get the same energy level. Now, I need to tell you, of course, that just because there's symmetry here, you see psi 2, 1 and psi 1, 2, that does not always happen. It's just happening for this particular wave function. So, or this particular, excuse me, scenario. What we're finding is we have two separate wave functions, psi 2, 1 and psi 1, 2. They're absolutely independent and separate wave functions. They're not dependent on each other, and I know there might, may look like there is symmetry, but there's no particular reason as to why one might equal the other. All right? So, what we found here is that we have two independent wave functions giving the same energy level, and that is the definition of a degenerate wave function. Okay, so like I said, like I'll say that once more, where we have equal energy levels, but we have unequal wave functions, then we must have degenerate energy levels or degenerate wave functions. Okay, that's, that's very important. So, is there anything else I'd like to discuss about that before we continue on? No, there isn't. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is look at all the energy levels for the particle in the two-dimensional box. So first of all, let's draw the energy levels. I'll let you work these out yourself. I'm not going to worry too much about them. So I'm going to well, say, I'm going to look at the first three energy bands. So this is the ground state. This is the first energy level. This is the second energy level. And we'll say for the first energy level, we'll find that a wave function is like psi n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 1. And a couple of other ones will all give us the same energy level. And here we'll say 2, 1, and 1, 2, and, five, and three other ones will give us the same energy level. And here 2, 2, and a couple of other ones will give the same energy level. The point is, in this case, the first three energy levels are all degenerate. Because different values of the quantum numbers, n and m, are giving us the same energy levels. So we're having degenerate energy levels. And the main point here is that degenerate energy levels and degenerate eigenfunctions are not unique. They're not unique, okay? So you could have a certain energy level and you might say to yourself, well, well, what's the wave function corresponding to this energy level? And you calculate it. And somebody else calculates the wave function, they get a different wave function. And you say to yourself, well, hold up a second, how do I fix this? The truth is that there might need to be fixing. You might genuinely have two separate wave functions, or you might have three or five or a million different wave functions, all giving you the same energy level. So that's what degeneracy means. Okay, now bear with me, I have quite, quite a good bit more to do, in particular in regard to symmetry. So the first thing I'd like to discuss is the fact that in the solutions for the infinite potential well, I had a series, I, I did it at, by moving my potential well around the origin, and I tried to get the, the energy levels and the wave functions there, and I was trying to get a kind of a, a, a sense of symmetry across to you. So, 
What, it, what, what I want to show you first of all is that the sine of a negative number is equal to negative times the sine of that of that the, of the positive number, and the cosine of a of a negative number is equal to the, the cosine of that positive number. So the cosine is what we call an even function, and the sine is what we call an odd function. Okay, so we might say this is invariant under the uh, exchange of parity. That's what you, you. That's if you want to be really technical. You say it's the invari it's invariant under the exchange of, of parity. And like I said, the cosine, uh, the net cosine of a negative is the same as the cosine of a positive. So cosine is even, but sine is odd. So next, I'd like to discuss what eigenvalues and eigenvectors and all the eigenfunctions are. So in this case, we're talking about the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which states that the Hamiltonian operator acting on psi is equal to the energy times psi. Now I spoke about the Hamiltonian when I defined when I when I um, derived the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So if you want to know more about the Hamiltonian, look at that. Now, if you're doing, let's say, a linear algebra course, you might find something like this. You'll see uh, something like this written down. Okay, one sec, bear with me now where an operator a acting on phi in this case gives you back a constant small a acting on phi again and what you'll be told is that phi is an eigenvector and that small a is an eigenvalue alright now in the case of functions what we'll say is that psi is the eigen function uh, this, that the energy level is the eigenvalue and that the Hamiltonian is the operator associated with it. All right. So, just to kind of remind, I would like to remind you of what happened when we started solving the infinite potential well and started moving the well around the origin. So, I'm going to give you two separate cases. The first one is when we uh, we centered the origin. Or excuse me, we centered the well at the origin. We went from 3a to negative 3a. Of course, the potential inside was zero, and it was infinity outside. And secondly, we had a well which went from 0 to 6a and had the same properties. Of course, the width of each of these wells is the same. So I did this uh, previously, and I'm going to show you what happened. We found that there was a common energy level for both of these, and the energy level, I did it separately, of course, but it turned out to be n squared, pi squared, h bar squared, over 72 times m times a squared. So what does that mean? Well, from what we've learned a moment ago, we found that these, this energy level here is well, it, you, you, is degenerate. Okay, well, it's not. It's actually not really degenerate. I suppose that's it, that's not correct to say because these are two different wells. But what it does suggest is that the, because the wells are the same width, they've got the same energy level. So the next question you should ask yourself well, is: is are the wave functions the same? And the answer is no. So for this uh, and this potential well, we got the following: we got psi of x is equal to well a n times a cosine. I won't even type in the rest. And here we got psi n or psi of x is equal to b n times a sine. Now, of course, actually, if you really look at my video, I actually had a sine solution here as well, but I'll ignore that because it's not very important. It's the cosine that's important here. So look, we have two separate wave functions. Okay giving us the same energy level and yet we're talking about two different wells. So the symmetry here we see is that where the, the wells are the same size we get the same energy but we get a different wave function. Now what happens if we look at the symmetry arguments here and this is what I was trying to get at in the past. The, or, the center of this well is not at the origin so if you swap it around it's, it's not the same. Okay, you don't, it's, it's not the same. However, of course, anything centered around the origin is very symmetric. So we found where we had a symmetric well, we got a symmetric or even, um, we got a symmetric or even wave function, namely cosine. And where we had an anti-symmetric well, we got an anti-symmetric, namely an odd function, in this case it's sine. Okay, so that just, get, just that's, that's a small bit of information which might be handy. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is discuss commutating or commuting oper operators or commutators. Say if I have two different functions, I'm going to call them A and B. Okay, they could be a Hamiltonian and something else. I don't know, it could be the Hamiltonian and the momentum operator. They're two different operators, and you might say, act those on, a, on, on something, and let's see what you get. Okay, so what happens if the order in which you apply the operators does not matter? So if A times, 
if you apply the B operator first and then the A operator, it's the same as applying the A operator first and then the B. Okay. Now look, it's actually not. The, I would be, it would be incorrect to write this because we have. I'm actually writing two operators, so I'll take this out. Okay. But there could be any operators really. Okay. Provided, of course, that this works. Now, if this happens here, if the order which something is um, co uh, co computed doesn't matter, they're said these f these operators are said to commute. Okay. And we know we know loads of operators which commute. We know that the the addition operator, the subtraction operators commute. Uh, we know we know that one plus two is equal to two plus one, for example. All right. And actual fact, this this operator doesn't commute. So two minus three is not the same as three minus two. Okay. Maybe its absolute value is, but anyway. So we know then that the that the addition operator commutes. So you know the 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 whole the concept of commutation is something which is not new to you. Now, how does one test for for two operators commuting? It's very straightforward. You compute what's called the commutator and you can see why it's called a commutator. You write the commutator like this, and basically it means AB minus BA. Now think about it, if two operators commute, AB minus BA is going to give you zero. And if they don't commute, it's going to give you a number other than zero, which tells you they don't commute. Why is this important? Now I'm not going to go into proving theorems, I'm just going to give you a result. Where you have two operators which commute, then, and we're going to say these two operators A and B, then the non, this is very important now, the non-degenerate eigenfunctions of A are eigenfunctions of B. And you might say, hold on a sec, this is very much pie in, the, pie in the sky stuff and it means nothing to me. And I'm going to show you in a moment why this is absolutely vital and that it's actually not difficult to understand. So just to repeat it, if I have two operators, A and B, and they commute, in other words, the, the commutator gives me zero, then non-degenerate eigenfunctions of the operator A are eigenfunctions of the operator B. All right, that's very important, that's a theorem, and I'll use this theorem just to illustrate it. Okay, so... What happens uh, if if I introduce a new operator? And the operator I'm going to introduce is the parity under inversion operator. And this is just p. It's not p hat because p hat is the momentum operator. So this is the parity under inversion operator, and it's very straightforward. The parity under inversion operator p acting on a function f of r is uh, f of negative r. All right. So you can see it's something similar to my cosine. Obviously the cosine, let's look at this, right? If I, it, the parity operator on cosine of r is equal to um, cosine of negative r. Okay, so you can, you, you can see, you, you, we've seen these things already, these operators. Now I'm gonna tell you something. The parity under inversion operator has two eigenfunctions which are not gonna prove, and the eigenfunctions are, um, well, they're positive and negative, or they're even, or odd, okay, and I don't want to go proving these, okay. So um, the eigen, oh, excuse me, eigenvalues are plus one and negative one. They're the eigenvalues of the parity under inversion operator, or we could say that the eigenfunctions, the eigenfunctions of p, are either odd or even. All right. So while you might not understand that yet. You should be just what you should be saying to yourself is I'm I'm keep I am still mentioning odd functions and even functions and we've seen already where how odd functions and even functions uh, are different and how by you know we've seen kind of different solutions with the infinite well so I'll, I'll just, we're just building up a picture here all right so so far we have eigenfunctions of the parity operator being uh, odd or even where its eigenvalues are one or negative one so next let's look at the Hamiltonian. All right. Now, like I say, look at my proof for the the time independent Schrodinger equation to learn more about the Hamiltonian. But if we look at the Hamiltonian of the the one dimensional box, or the we'll say the what's it called the the infinite potential well, where outside we have v is equal to zero, or infinity, and inside we have v is equal to zero, and if we place the the well at the origin. Now, 
I'll let you do this yourself, but I'm going to prove basically that in this case, I'll show you how to prove it, and I won't really, I won't actually explain it, but I'm just going to show you, if you want, you can look at it yourself, how to show that the, uh, that the Hamiltonian is actually invariant under inversion. So in other words, that P times H is equal to H, or, or what's H of R, is equal to H of negative R. Alright, I'm just going to show you how to do that. And I'll explain its physical significance in a moment, so just bear with me. If you apply V of negative X, you're going to find it's V of X, that's the first thing. If you get the derivative, you're going to find it's equal to negative D dx. And if you get the second derivative, you're going to find it's the same as the second derivative like that. Alright. And as a result, we'll be able to say that the Hamiltonian is, is invariant under inversion. So that H of R is equal to H of negative R. Okay? It is invariant under inversion. Now I'm going to give you another theorem. Alright? If an operator... If an operator is invariant uh, under inversion of coordinates it commutes with the parity operator All right now it's time to remind ourselves of the other theorem I mentioned a moment ago just one, mo just one moment I said a moment ago that if two operators I'm going to say, I'm going to actually put in their names at this stage, P and H, uh, commute, then non-degenerate eigenfunctions of P are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, and vice versa, okay, and, and opposite, and, and vice versa, right? And how is this important? And now we're really coming to the meat of the whole point, the, the meat of the whole thing here. We're, we've just said a moment ago that h of r, h of r is equal to h of negative r. Okay? So we'll say that that's how you say that the parity operator acts on the Hamiltonian like that. So that means that the parity operator and the Hamiltonian commute. So you will say the commentator is like this. That means they commute. And we've just found out what the eigenfunctions of the parity operator are. We found that the eigenfunctions of the parity operator were even and odd functions. And now we've just said that the parity operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. Alright? So, we, like I said, just to say it again, if it's invariant under inversion, then it commutes with the parity operator. And if, some, if two operators commute, then their eigenfunctions are, 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 are kind of, you can swap them. So that means that the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are even or odd because they commute with the it commutes with the parity operator. And what did we find? We found that the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian sometimes had cosine solutions and sometimes had sine solutions. And we said the cosine solutions were even and the sine solutions were odd. Alright? That's very important. So if something commutes with the parity operator, then its eigenfunctions are even or odd. And uh, even or odd, the Hamiltonian, not in every case, absolutely not in every case, you have to look at the Hamiltonian in each case. In this case, the Hamiltonian commutes with the parity operator. Therefore, the, the eigenfunctions of the parity opera operator, which are even or odd, are also eigenfunctions of the uh, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. Okay? So like I said, non-degenerate eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are also eigenfunctions of the parity operator. Okay? So this is an important concept, and this is just me introducing it. And if you understand this concept, I can, I can guarantee you it will help you a lot in the future. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.